There is one thin board between me and oblivion, and you are spouting philosophy. Can't you talk like a real person? If you're wondering where that's from, it comes from one of Stan Lee's cameos, even in his own comics or script writing. Stan Lee. We like to talk about him here every now and then, maybe every month or something of that nature. And I want to go into one of his characters, uh, the Silver Surfer, the Silver Surfer. You can pretend like you're at an experience or comic con. Have you ever been to one of those? Uh, different, uh, uh, arenas. I know in the United States and maybe even around the world, uh, they actually will have the writers, actors, uh, from, um, sci-fi, you see, uh, a board or panel often there. Uh, to talk with the audience, to also answer questions, depending on how it's set up. And it's one of those wonderful experiences where even the people who go there may dress up like superheroes, their favorite captains of ships, or uh, some of the other officers, or uh, aliens that, you know, you never really uh, thought too much f about. But all that science fiction and comic books uh, at Comic Con, uh, not even to mention some of the technology, uh, that happens to be around. Because in those places, they tend to run together around the same time, you see, in a nice, uh, warmer weather times of being able to enjoy these events. Now, speaking of Stan Lee and the Silver Surfer, I want to take this time to share this one article that I would consider is still evergreen. Evergreen is an expression used about any article written that really continues to apply all year round. Uh, it's timeless. It never really goes out of style. And the person who actually wrote this article I will share at the end uh, of the signature. But he did such a great job way back in November of 2018, you see. Uh, November of 2018. And I will be sure to put the link to this article uh, with uh, this podcast on the James Poirier Productions commentary right now that we're doing. Now, I'm going to read how Stanley felt about the Silver Surfer. You see, he was not the one who actually created the Silver Surfer initially. It was Jack Kirby. However, Silver Surfer quickly became um, Stan Lee's favorite character. See, people know he loved Spider-Man, but he also loved the Silver Surfer. And he looked at him more of a philosopher you see, observer of the whole universe, um, uh, especially in the Earth realm. Uh, why? Uh, because when I get through reading this article, you will see or hear more in depth why the Silver Surfer was actually trapped within the galaxy of the Earth, you see, um, in the universe. Uh, at least when it started off, I remember that it seemed like he couldn't go maybe past um, Pluto. But I think it was for sure he couldn't get out the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, but I, uh, you know, but as I said in the beginning, the impression uh, that I had picked up that he couldn't even go past uh, Pluto, you see, uh, to break this cosmic, invisible cosmic barrier that Galactus, this planet devourer, uh, this force of nature that apparently was needed to keep balance throughout the universe, the whole universe, you see, had placed them there. But, you see, whatever is not mentioned in this article, then, you know, I'll share more. But make no mistake about it. I quickly read through, you know, skimming fast uh, through this Stan Lee and the Silver Surfer uh, from the... Uh, four color forum 
to actually share with you today in this Perceptive Readers, you see James Pawatishry commentary. I think you will find a lot of value uh, with this. I, I know you will. I know you will. So let us start. Last week, I wrote about the effect that one of Stan Lee's most iconic co-creations had on me as a young comic book fan. This week, I wanted to focus instead on a character that impacted me greatly in my teenage years and into adulthood. Although not technically a Stanley creation, and in fact, the character's provenance was the source of some controversial or controversy. The story of the Silver Surfer is undeniably associated with Stan and is an important part of the writer's legacy. In tribute, here's a look at the comic book that brought me closer to Stan Lee's worldview as seen through the eyes of the lonely sentinel of the spaceways and gave me a better appreciation of the man who helped make Marvel Comics what it is today. Silver Surfer. The Silver Surfer number one, 1988. By eighth grade, I was well and truly entrenched in the Marvel Universe, but apart from random issues of 70s Defenders and summarized tales in Marvel Saga, I didn't know much about the Silver Surfer until the debut of Steve Englehart's series and the release of Joe Saturnine's Saturnine Surfing with the Alien. Both of those artifacts were gateway drugs into the immersive world of Marvel's galactic space opera. And I spent many of my high school years moving backwards and forwards into Jim Starlin and Ron Lim Eras digging on Warlock, Eternity, and all the trippy infinity watching and cosmic hand-holding. But in 1988, another Silver Surfer hit the stands under Marvel's epic imprint. And it felt important enough that, despite its incongruities and lack of adherence to all important continuity, I was compelled to add it to my weekly pool. It was the first of the two-part parable story by Stan Lee and French artist Morbius. Some of the credit for buying this comic goes to my local comics purveyor, the goatee and ponytail clerk at best of two worlds. Although by the time this book came out, he was working at their second height street location, the name of which escapes me. Unlike his shockingly accurate character, caricature on The Simpsons, this comic book guy was far less concerned with speculative value crossover promotions, or even superheroes in general. In fact, a couple of years earlier, he memorably shoved his pudgy finger onto the cover of a comic I had just dropped onto the counter and announced. This is toilet paper. Toilet paper. I remember the issue of this day. Incredible Hulk number 323. Then he convinced me to buy the first issue of Morrill and Gibbons' Watchmen and the latest printing of Miller's Dark Knight Returns. For disclosure, I also went home with that crappy Marvel comic. <laughs> so by 1988, of course, I was a full-on comic snob and was therefore a bit surprised that I was being told to buy anything written by Stan Lee. I was recognized... His importance, I recognize his importance and, of course, had read a ton of Amazing Spider-Man growing up. But Stan's floored dialogue and hyperbolic descriptions felt so out of place in a four-color world dominated by the likes of Chris Claremont, Frank Miller, and Alan Moore. This was something different, though. And not just because of the amazing art of Morbius, my first real exposure to comics legend, intentionally set apart from the Marvel Universe, I knew it was an Elseworlds st story before that term meant anything. A beautiful, self-contained parable 
in every sense of the world. Word. Yes, the art is breathtaking and helped foster strong disagreement with Denzel's Crimson Tide assertion that the Kirby Silver Surfer is the only true Silver Surfer. That was a quote. Although, to be fair, I wouldn't give that nod to Morbius either. But Stan's story and script took me completely by surprise. <laughs> Did you catch that? That quote from Denzel's Crimson Tide assertion that the Kirby Silver Surfer is the only true Silver Surfer. Anyway, that was me. Let me go right back to the article. All right. So, continuing on. There's something in the character. It's true that lends itself to somber, uh, somber melodrama. The lonely orphan skyrider shunned by a world he vows to protect. In this particular story, furthermore, the surfer is rejected by a society that is caught up in the grips of religious fanaticism. As much or as more and more of the global populace reveres Galactus as a god, Lee's treatise on the dangers of organized religion became clearer. In the surfer's worlds, or words, excuse me, quote, why cannot they realize that the truest faith is faith in oneself? What has made them so desperate to have others show them the way? End quote. This book captured everything I was feeling at the time, echoing not just the tireless warnings of my father that people lie and manipulate, so be your own man and think your own thoughts, but also the discomfort I felt that after years of Catholic schooling that I was being spoon-fed indigestible rhetoric, limiting my outlook on the world. I fell in love with this character, this glimmering figure possessed of near-infinite power and solely dependent on his own self to understand and explore the world. As a kid heading off to college in a few years, I couldn't have asked for a more potent effing metaphor. <laughs> Thanks, Stan. <laughs> All right. Continuing on. I have known the heady exultation of victory. I have known the gnawing pain of defeat. But I shall never cease searching for an oasis of sanity in the desert of madness that men call Earth. In the subsequent years, I learned more about the surfer and his story, including all of the behind-the-scenes drama that rippled in his starry wake. Jack Kirby created the character himself, but Stan adopted him as his own. When it came time to launch the Surfer's first solo series, Kirby was passed over for art duties in favor of John Buscema. This was an act of betrayal in Kirby's mind that represented the final straw hastening the King's departure for D.C. I was caught up in the pro-Kirby buzz and artist rights movement of the 90s and naively assumed maybe like Denzel, that the true surfer, silver surfer, could only ever emanate from the pencil of Jack Kirby. I actually remember that those disagreements. Anyway, then I read Lee and Bosima's series, and I read Kirby's Fantastic Four. The surfer, as he originally appears in that galactic story, is cold and robotic, and despite his sacrifice in the narrative, is visually quite far from the surfer I had come to see as a chrome-plated avatar of self-awareness. Eventually, Inglehart took over a new volume of Silver Surfer. This was during my era, and although I didn't know it at the time, Stan had been saddened that another writer was taking the reins on a Norn Red book. This was the one character, so the story goes, that Stan Wish could only ever have been scripted by him. Oblivious to how much heart and soul Stan had imparted to the server, surfer, I followed the character's exploits, 
with zeal. Year after year, decade after decade, Ron Lim became one of my favorite artists. And when I met him at the most recent San Diego Comic Con, I was bound and determined to squeeze myself onto his commission list of more recent vintage Dan Slott and Mike Alfred's series or All Reds series, excuse me, hold sway among the best comics I've read in recent years. My kids and my friends have all received trades as gifts for one occasion or another. Today, I recognize the Lee and Bosima series for the triumph that it is. Learning how many college-bound kids of that era felt a similar connection to the surfer's internal crisis. Count me among the fans who believe this, not only the artist's best work, but Stan Lee's finest as well. Basima might well be the definitive surfer artist, but I don't think I am completely out of line to correct that movie quote by saying, Stan Lee's Silver Surfer is the only true Silver Surfer. Here's to you, Stan. Like Norn in the 80s, you are no longer hell bound to the earth. Soar on. And let me end this podcast again with his last quote. Here's to you, Stan. Like Norn in the 80s, you are no longer hell bound to the earth. Soar on. You have just listened to the Perceptive Readers Podcast. Remember, until next time, if you read something that encourages you to improve or enhance your life for the better, it becomes your reality. <laughs>